guy who discipled me when I was a teenager. So every good thing you can say thank you to him, every terrible thing, it's his fault as well. So there you go. But Paul and I, uh, we, we grew up in Durban and were involved in, in, in incredible what God was doing in Durban, a move of God, and, and, and we were able to be a part of that. And just incredible just to dream. We never dreamt that years later we'll be able to minister in each other's churches. And Paul's a pastor, a worship leader that's renowned around the country and around the world. And, uh, and, but also in, in Joburg, he's a part of an amazing church there. But just the privilege that we could do church together and we can worship together like this. So maybe this is not as big a thing for you, but it is for me because this is my good mate, my good friend who I love dearly. I'm incredibly proud of. Um, he's a father of three, got an amazing wife called Evie. But just wanted to honor you, Paul. And uh, I want to tell you that you are a phenomenal man. Um, I wouldn't be where I am today if it was not for you. I'm in internally grateful for your love, your challenging, your shepherding, your prioritizing Jesus above all things, uh, your leadership in my life. And um, I am so, so thrilled that you get to come and preach uh, here with my incredible, amazing people here at Life Change. So come on up, Paul. Let's welcome Paul up. And uh, I've introduced you to these amazing people. Let me tell you about these people, Paul. These are some of the best people you'll ever get to preach to. Honestly, the best people. This is the kindest church. This is the most faithful church. These people take notes, so don't say dodgy stuff because they'll write it down. So you record? <laughs> we, we record all this stuff as well. But, but these are amazing people who uh, I love and uh, have the privilege of being a pastor too. And um, it's a, such a joy to have you here to speak to us as a life changer Center City people. So everybody, open your hearts wide. This is an amazing gift. And I really believe God's gonna stir something for the more of him to this morning in our hearts. Take it away, Paul Eady. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's amazing to be world renowned for the first time in my life. Um, whole world would miss me if I, if I disappeared, whole world. But it really is such an incredible privilege, really. I do not take it lightly at I am humbled to be standing in this pulpit. And uh, I just wanna say in honor of this man, Gabriel Phillips, uh, they say, you know, um, depending on how you follow other leaders, once, once you get to that position of leadership, You'll, you'll see like that replicated in the people that follow you. And the way he's described you is no doubt because of what I experienced of him, a guy in my kidneys, a guy that sometimes often had more vision than I did. He was just, this guy is a go-getter. I am not surprised at all that he stands and calls you like his community uh, today. And uh, really, so I just very proudly and uh, with a lot of honor in my heart can commend him before all of you, he is a man of in integrity. He's a man who's grown up from a young age loving Jesus, finding Jesus in the secret place, doing the right thing before the eyes of God when no one else is looking. This is a man you can trust deeply. And so, Gavin Fee, thank you very much for having me today. It is awesome. My wife will be joining me later in the week, but we'll be at Table View next week. Um, so we're gonna kick off and uh, look at Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the sower. So I don't know if we've got it on the screen, but um, I'm going to read it, fairly lengthy portion. It says, that same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear." The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Those seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. 
For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. We'll stop there. And there's three major things that kind of jump out to me in this parable. The first is the, the, the privilege of the revelation of Jesus. That these disciples, not the most qualified or worthy lot, but they, after all these amazing, powerful men of God and women of God, these prophets and prophetesses, they were the ones that got this revelation. They got the word made flesh. They got the prophecies uh, from days of old, the ancient prophecies made flesh before their very eyes, addressing them and revealing the secrets of the kingdom of heaven to them. Who's a disciple in the room today? I wanna say we carry that same privilege. We get the revelation of God, the, the, the word made flesh coming to us and relating with us and, and sharing the secrets of the kingdom with us. The other thing that jumped out was verse 12. Whoever has will be given more and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Now, when I read a scripture like that, I'm like, God, that seems mean. It seems like capitalism, the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, right? But then in trying to like, grapple with it like, and understand it, you know, I know we're not supposed to add to scripture, but in, in the, for the purpose of trying to get the meaning of what the scripture is saying, I added some words. Whoever has faith will be given more faith. Whoever has a desire for God will be given more desire for God. Whoever hungers and thirsts for his presence will hunger and thirst more for his presence. Whoever has the knowledge of God will be given more knowledge of God. Whoever has experienced his manifest presence will continue to be given experiences of his manifest presence. Whoever has the revelation of Christ will continue to grow and be given more revelation of Christ. It seems like it's perpetual. It never stays the same. It either perpetually grows or it's perpetually removed. It never stays stagnant. The third thing that jumps out of this parable is the words calloused hearts. We know a callous is a hard layer of skin that develops from too much rub, too much friction, too much pressure, too much stress, right? And that, that skin, that hard layer of skin is there, actually it, it's a protective layer. The skin does that in order to protect itself. Now what is this parable about? It seems to be about keeping our hearts in a consistent condition of receiving the word, all right? So what is it to receive the word? It's this revelation. It's, it's, it's not just more head knowledge. It's, it's, it's not just, I know my Bible. I, I can tell you the whole narrative from Genesis to Revelation, and I can tell you the, the history of the Israelites and where one thing fits into another. And it, it's a person, The revelation of the word is, is, is keeping our hearts in a, in a consistent condition to receive a rev, to see him clearly, to hear his voice clearly. Where we are in a state where the word of God forms us. And just as it created in the very beginning, created all things by the power of his word, just as it brought Lazarus out of the tomb, just as it brought the fruitless fig tree to nothing by just a word, that creative power and authority of God's word intends to recreate us into his image. That's what he's wanting to do. He's wanting, it's not like, oh, great, great word, I'm so encouraged. No, he wants to reform and recreate and reshape our very identities by the word of God. See, we, we speak often about the doctrine of original sin, but we don't speak often enough about the discovery of original design. 
the word doesn't come to us to always say, remember, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. Remember, sin, sin your original sin, really, you're fallen, you're broken, you're broken. Yes, it comes, and, it's, and, and that word speaks a, a better word than the blood of Abel. It sets us free from the power and the hold of that original sin. But then it goes beyond, and it, or should I say he, Jesus Christ, the word of God, the Logos, the word made flesh, he's the one who calls us onward. He calls us. He says, come forward, come out of that. That's done, that's in the past, but you are a new creation. Come and live a life worthy of that call that you've received. I'm calling you to myself. Come participate in my divine nature. Come and follow me in living a life that is completely Godward, that is obsessed with God. Dallas Willard, amazing author, recommend his books. He, um, he said this, the fundamental secret of caring for our souls is to direct and redirect our minds constantly to God. So in the light of this parable, keeping our hearts in a, in a consistent state of being open to being formed by the revelation of Jesus, the best way to do that is to constantly direct and redirect our minds to God. There's so many distractions in this life, aren't there? But the only, the only way we can do it is we just obsess about him. Obsess. He's the one. He's the, he, he's the center of everything that we are, everything we look at. And the moment he stops being that, we need, a, we need realignment. Remember that God wants to reveal himself to us but even more so, he wants to reveal himself through us. This, this, this word that, that the parable is talking about, receiving the word, it's about God revealing himself to the nations. It's about us reflecting him, becoming, he, he said that, that Jesus Christ would be the firstborn among many brothers, that we would be conformed to the likeness of his son. That was what we were predestined to be. That was his purpose. That is fundamental purpose for all of our lives. Romans 8, 29. For those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. That is what he wants for us. He wants us to reflect, live as Jesus lived, walk as Jesus walked. But why are we so often caught out? So often reflecting the nature of the world around us more than the nature of Christ to the world around us. So I wanna ask a question. Who has one of those fridges with the plumbed in water dispenser? Anyone? Plumbed in fridge? Don't be shy. Wear it proudly. Just four. Let's go for four. Do I hear four? All right, just, I see two, two of us. Don't be shy, don't be shy, it's okay. You can look down your noses at the rest of us. You can judge us better than all of us. You, you really are. And um, so you don't have this problem, but uh, anyone here have a fridge with a water dispenser that's not plumbed in? Oh, do you have that? Ah, oh, that's why you were like that, huh? Um, so I got one of those. Now, I have a wife. I have a 12-year-old boy, Judah. I have a 10-year-old girl, Olivia. And I have a four-year-old girl, Charlotte. And I have a golden retriever across Labrador, Nova. And um, in my household, too many times that I care to admit, I can be like working outside in the garden or whatever. It can be hot, I'm parched. I really, I need hydration. I need refreshing. I need cold water. That's what I need. That's what my body's longing for. And I come back inside sweaty, <sighs> pick up a glass. Crickets. Nothing. No water. And at that point, Christ shines through me. Flawlessly, the nature of God ripples through my very being. Rolling eyes, looking for someone to blame, frustration, hopefully not too much anger, but it's like, who finished the water and didn't fill it up? You know, you gotta take that thing out, carry it across the sink, fill it up, 
carry it back, spill everywhere, put it back in. While you're putting it in, shh, pours out of the thing, close the fridge. Oh, worth it. Cool story. So, in my case, there is a reliance on an internal, limited, and very clearly unreliable source that has an inevitable end. And uh, at that point, when it's on empty, and you only know it's running low when it's empty. There's no other way to know that you're empty than when it's empty. Um, but my family are the first ones to, to, to see the uh, visible evidence that I'm running on empty. But when you're plumbed into the municipal supply, let, let it be known that if I was to give this analogy in Joburg or Durban, it would fall flat. <laughs> but when you are plumbed into the municipal supply, the source is outside of you, outside of your resources. It is larger than what your fridge could ever contain and is consistently dependable. See, when we run on empty, we feel the rub of life. We feel the friction. We feel the knocks. The joy starts to ooze. The peace starts to leak. And that hard protective layer of self-preservation starts to form over our hearts. And even what we have is taken away. It's just carved away, carved away, carved away. My wife shared a quote with me. I wouldn't be able to give credit to the person because I, I don't know who said this, but they said this, many Christians who used to be on fire are now burnt out because we taught them to pursue the fire instead of oil. To after ministry fire instead of secret place oil. How true is that of us? We gotta hop from one conference to the next, whatever, one Sunday to the next. We're constantly burnt out, we're constantly... <gasps> In, in that moment, you need it. In that moment, you need the resources that are beyond you. In that moment where something happens at work or there's a challenge, there's something that you, you're needing to tap into that grace, that Christ-like grace, that empowering that he's given you. But actually, you haven't dug it, the well. And you go at that moment and you realize only at that point, this is where it shows. And the evidence or the lack of evidence of God's grace is revealed. So I am a guitarist, and I get calluses on fingers on this hand, this little couple of fingers. And after playing, obviously, the kind of calluses will form and whatever. And, but then after a couple of days, they'll peel off, revealing like baby-like skin on my fingers. And um, my prayer today Simple, this is not like a uh, new revelation, everyone. This is just basic. But my prayer today is that some of us would just peel that hard layer of skin off and reveal soft, open, vulnerable hearts presenting ourselves completely to Jesus. Completely, completely open to him. See, self-preservation self is not a condition that is susceptible to the revelation of God. When we like so mistrusting and like everything we guarded, it's just calloused. But rather, God responds to vulnerability and complete trust. Think of Psalm 24, lift up your heads, O your gates, be lifted up your ancient doors and let the King of glory come in. There's an openness that he's waiting for, an invitation. He's, op he's like, open up your arms, open up your hearts, open up your minds, open up everything, open up your lives and let the King of glory come in. And I believe there are some here who have longed for what once was in your relationship with God. You have stories to tell. You have faith in the God who was. You even have faith in the God who is to come. You, you believe that you can encounter him in your future. 
but you've lost faith in the God who is. The great I am. Where is he now? I wanna tell you that he's the ever present one. He lives an eternal now. He's not subject to past nor future. He's lived all your tomorrows just as he's lived all your yesterdays. He feels the same way about you today as the day he formed you, the day he ordained every one of your days. And he loves you as much today as he will when you're 10,000 years into your eternal heavenly praise. He loves you the same today. No matter what you've done, no matter where you are, no matter how dry you are, no matter the drought, no matter the wilderness, no matter what, no matter the fruitlessness, no matter, he loves you the same today as he will 10,000 years into your heavenly praise. He never changes. He is not subject to anything. He's the self-existent one. He needs nothing from anyone outside of himself. He's dependent on no one for his satisfaction or contentment. He's the only truly free and independent being in all of existence. Yet, he has chosen freely to bind his heart to you and me. For no other reason than his good pleasure. Today, he wants you. And he wants all of you. He will give you as much of himself as you want. The question today is how much of him do you want? He will give you, 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 like, you know when you go for a job interview and they say, well, give, what salary do you want? That's what he's saying to you. How much do you want? But beware, because he's a lot. You know those people, they're a lot. God is a lot. He doesn't really do installments <laughs> or work in compartments. He paid the full price, his own life, the life of his only begotten son. <laughs> for the fullness of all humanity to receive the full rights of sons, total authority as heirs of his kingdom, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. He paid this for eternal life for anyone who would believe to give them an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. He only works in hyperboles. I've got a, a quote up in my office by Francis Chan that sits right in front of me and says, what a comfort it is to know that we worship a God we cannot exaggerate. He only works in hyperboles. He's not half in love with you. He's not half com committed to your life. He didn't half create you. He hasn't got like 40% his purpose and then you make up the rest. all in we can stand and we can say bless me Lord but A.W. Tozer says with, that God cannot bless a man until he has conquered him we can stand and say I want the fire I want the fire of God Jeremy Riddle in his book The Reset says this without surrender there is no worship no sacrifice Nothing for fire to fall on. I don't know if you've heard of Evan Roberts. He was the man who kind of catalyzed the Welsh revival, saw incredible things, saw a powerful move of God that, that changed history. 
this was the man that kind of that, that God used to birth that move. His prayer was simply, bend me, Lord. Bend me, Lord. Bend me, Lord. Bend me, Lord. Bend my will. Bend my worldview. Bend my desires. Bend my hungers and thirsts. Bend my time. Bend my goals, my dreams. Bend them to what you would have them look like. As Moses asked God to show him his glory and then he took refuge in the cleft of the rock, today we get to ask God to again show us his glory but we get to hide all of our shortcomings in the wounds of Christ. Today we can take refuge from God in God. Like it doesn't, there's no one in this room that is excluded from this. Yes, you have fallen. Yes, you have, you don't, you, you fall short of the glory of God. So do I. Yet today we can say, show me your glory and we hide ourselves in the wounds of Christ and we take refuge from God in God. Surrounded by him, surrounded by his presence, surrounded by just the warmth of his father heart, his sincere love for us, his compassion, his mercy his dreams for us. Think about it. Think about it. If, if you're a dad, think about, what, think about how you feel about your kids. Imagine just being surrounded by the perfect father, his arms around you, his love, his commitment to you, his devotion to you. His, that's what we get today. Alan Scott said this, your history is the sign the signpost to your inheritance, as you take the memory of previous victory into new territory, your one-off experience becomes the doorway to ongoing abundance. You could be thinking that, oh, those experiences I have of God, that, that oh, if only I could walk with him the way I used to, if only I could feel his presence, if only I could, when I read his word, it, I remember times where it was just like it illuminated to me. My soul would leap. As I got revelation, it wasn't just words on a page, but it was like the, the person of Jesus, the, the nature of God, the character of God. He was revealing things about myself. There was, he was talking to me. If only I could go back to that place. I wanna say, your history is the signpost to your inheritance. It's not a thing for the past. It's actually something to build on for your future. For some, you experience those movements of God. You experience the movement of God. But that movement has become a monument that cannot be moved. And now, God tries to move, but you compare it to that monument. And so you're unmoved because you're so busy comparing the fresh move of God to a monument. And I wanna say, say to that mountain, go and throw yourself into the sea. I couldn't get away from uh, the feeling that God wants to unblock wells this morning. That some of our wells have become a dumping ground. Dumping ground from other, others, other people's rubbish that they've just chucked in there. They haven't cared for who we are. Maybe our own stuff. Maybe we've treated our wells poorly and we've thrown in rubbish. But either way, God wants them free. God wants them open. God wants them clear because he wants fresh water to spring up. And obviously the reference to a well, I can't get away from the Samaritan lady in John chapter four. And I couldn't, I can't help but think it was her shame that brought her to the well in the middle of the day. That's, it, it was a shame that brought her to a place of encountering Jesus and finding freedom. Jesus used the very thing she struggled with to bring her into a place of life-changing, freedom-finding, saving grace encounter with him. 
you may have a struggle today. But Jesus didn't cause that struggle, but I believe he will use it to bring you to a place of freedom. To a place of meeting him, to a place of encountering him, to a place of knowing him, a place of revelation. Just as he used sin to defeat sin and strip it of its power, I believe he's gonna use your struggle to defeat your struggle and strip it of its power. The struggle is not your obstacle to coming to him. This morning, your struggle is your invitation to coming to him. In John chapter seven, Jesus said, come to me, those who are thirsty, and I will give you drink. I will give you water to drink. He didn't say, come to me all who are satisfied, hydrated, and perfectly content. I wanna say your struggle is not your obstacle this morning, it's your invitation. He said it's not the healthy who need a doctor. He came because we're sick, humanity was sick. He's not surprised by our shortcomings and he's given us his wounds to hide in this morning. My prayer is that we would just peel back that callous skin, that the disappointment, the stress, the pressure of life, whatever it is, the shame, we'd peel it back this morning and our hearts would be soft. We would be vulnerable before him again and say, Lord, actually, I just trust you. I, 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 I give all of me. I give all of me. I lay my, my whole life at your feet and say, do with me as you please. Bend me, Lord. I want you. If I have nothing else but I have you, I have everything. If I have nothing else but I have you, I have everything. If I have nothing else but I have you, Jesus, I have everything. I com consider all things rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord.